So I'm really excited to be here today with Dr. Tamsin, um, who's a medical doctor. She has a BSc in neuroscience and she's a former GB elite triathlete. Um, she specializes in the biology of aging and is the founder of Worldgevity and also works at the Lanzerhof Clinic at the Arts Club in London. Um, you have so many um, specialities. That, first of all, I don't think I've really done um, credit really in that intro, Dr. Tamsin. <laughs> Would you like to give a bit more background? Because I know you combine a lot of traditional medicine with functional medicine and biohacking. Could you share with our listeners a bit more about you? Sure. Um, well, thanks for the introduction to start with. Yeah, I'm a medical doctor trained in King's College in London, um, where I also did a BSc, Bachelor of Science in Biology of Aging and Neuroscience. I did a postgraduate qualification in psychiatry, membership of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, because I liked spending time with people, talking to people, understanding people. Um, subsequent to that, I took a sabbatical for three years um, as I was doing well as an amateur in triathlon. Um, and I got, um, I was on the Great Britain team. I trained with some of the best athletes around the world, um, culminated in me doing the Ironman triathlon and winning Ironman UK in 2014. Then I got pregnant, had my daughter, who's now five. Um, during that time as an athlete, I learned a lot about um, this concept of health um, being more than just the absence of disease. And this concept that um, we can be advocates for our own health, we can get insights into our own health, we can be, we can have a collaborative relationship with our doctor. And that's when I first started to get interested in blood testing, um, gut health testing um, and other testing in, in order to look at what we call biomarkers, where certain things sit, you know, your vitamins, your hormones, those kind of things, and how you can just be better as opposed to, you know, diagnosing whether you have an illness or not. Yeah, so that's, and, and that culminated in me setting up um, a company called Curo7 with a couple of, with a GP friend of mine, which was essentially data analytics um, looking at tests and looking at how you could optimize your performance, mostly in sport at the start. It transcended to becoming something a bit bigger, um, probably through my own personal journey of finding through this whole concept of biohacking, functional medicine, excuse me, root cause analysis, that something was a bit missing. I'd see lots of very, you know, on paper, healthy people that were, you know, eating very good diets, taking loads of supplements, but they were, they were deeply unhappy on some level. And I think that was driving, you know, subjective sensations of low mood or stress or insomnia. <clears throat> so I guess it was my background in psychiatry that, that funneled through to, to this concept of longevity. And, and what underpins that is, um, is this whole concept of how do we create health span? And how do we create health span? A big part of that is is your perceptive sense of self of well-being, of, um, of connectedness, of purpose, of, um, yeah, like psychological well-being. So while well, Jeopardy was basically founded by myself, working with a naturopath and nutritionist, health coach, and a range of other doctors to, uh, whom I inter-refer to, um, and personal trainer, um, basically to kind of create, you know, this intuitive sense of self-awareness in yourself so you can refer to brilliant practitioners but also you can learn more about your own physiology and what what serves you and what what helps you to flourish and become a better human so essentially to come kind of the most optimized version of yourself basically but the, uh, uncovering what optimized means is um is different for different people mm -hmm. um so so I think the having the initial consultation, this exploration with a with a practitioner or a group of practitioners or myself, can very much help you uncover what that pathway to optimization looks like. Because it's not the same for you as it is for me, and that's why I like to see data up front. Right, we get an objective data set on the blood test, sometimes your microbiome, although the data on that is, or the the research around that is is very much up and coming. We also consider some of your genetics, not all of them, because that's an overpromise. I also look at your, your mood scores, your exercise tolerance, your body composition, your bone density. All of these things come into interplay about where, what do you need to become better? 
it's not a generic one size fits all, you know, so, you know, there's not one best diet. There's not even one best diet for the same person for the rest of their life, you know? So I develop very close relationships with individuals, often with families so that we can work out, really work out um, what, what, what's the best, you know, case scenario for them. And what have you found in terms of when you have people that come to see you with, um, I know we were talking a little bit earlier about people who have kind of low mood. Um, sometimes that can trip into things like depression. Um, they've got low energy, but they can't find a reason for that. I know we were discussing ourselves about my <clears throat> history with um, postnatal depression and, and how often for women that can be actually hormonally driven. Yes, for sure. Um, and as we did say that, <clears throat> that actually from my, from my own experience was one of the drivers of what helped, what led me to study bioidentical hormones, the interplay with hormones and mental health. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I, when I first started off learning about bioidentical hormones with Marion Gluck and this Dr. Sarah Gottfried, I, I was fascinated between the interplay between the two, but in, unless you measure things, you don't really know what the interplay is. I mean, in someone like you, the story is, um, you know, classically you have massive um, demand on your system when you have pregnancy. So you go into pregnancies with a period of, you know, high adrenal system demand, high stress demand, being a lawyer, you know, you know, really not allowing yourself time for recuperation. And I, I should preempt this by saying that that mindset is can drives the body to the limits right and you can keep up you especially can keep up when you're in your 30s late 20s the body has a lot of capacity then but it's not until you get into your late 30s 40s specifically you then have huge physiological demands of pregnancy and giving birth that you suddenly end up falling off a cliff and i see that time and time again and it's it's very difficult for people it's certainly difficult for people who are you know, high achieving individuals, because all of a sudden you have no idea why you feel so terrible. And the doc you go to the doctors and they say, well, you're depressed. Let's have an antidepressant. And then you succumb to this whole thing of, geez, like I wasn't, I'm not a depressive. How did I become a depressive? Surely yeah. there's got to be more here. <laughs> what happened to me? <laughs> you're yeah. like, I've got this label. I mean, this slap and you're like, mm. so, you know, my own story is, is looking at how do we shift the physiology to affect the psychology and you absolutely can do that the filter on the world is on your world is dependent on your biochemistry to some degree your, and it's a dynamic interplay it's a dynamic interplay between you know the people you come into contact with the practices you do on a day-to-day -day basis you know the self self-care which i didn't like as a term but i'm getting used to liking it um, all of that is a, has a dynamic effect on your physiology, which has an effect on your hormones. So we work in this kind of system, this interplay between the two, but you've got to have some kind of measurement and some kind of, you know, relationship with a doctor or a practitioner or a naturopath, whoever it is, as long as they're, you know, credible, because there are some people out there who are not, um, you can really be guided through this journey. And what I've learned through my own practice is that this is hugely valuable for people. It's just being heard, having someone to reflect stuff off, having data which supports how you feel, and you can see changes in by different interventions. Um, that's, that's hugely valuable. Yeah, I think- So it, if I use an example, um, you know, for you, I mean, we haven't done any testing, we, we, we can do and we could go through it and we could, we could plot the sort of um, the time course and see, you know, how interventions could help you, how you feel and how that's reflected in testing data. Um, you know, it's most likely you'd be low on DHEA, a pro-hormone, you'd be low on um, progesterone, pregnenolone, um, probably some of the major antioxidant systems like glutathione. Um, there's probably, as you said, with your history of PCOS, this, this kind of androgen dominance, mm. which are the, the, the male hormones which can happen. Um, especially when there's been chronic stress. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's many things that come into play, but um, you know, shifting the biochemistry definitely helps the psychology. Yeah, 
I can imagine. And, and, and as, we, as we spoke about, I'd definitely like to get that tested. And then I think that could help people as well understand um, the kind of testing that they can do um, to, to shift their physiology. As you, as you mentioned there, like I used to really struggle with the concept of self-care and actually focusing on that has been the only thing really that's enabled me to get away from that diagnosis of chronic <clears throat> depressive disorder and actually shift my mood. Um, and it's a daily practice um, in terms of the different things that I do. Um, a combination of sort of gratitude and meditation and journaling. And I think sometimes people will, I certainly, as a kind of classic type A personality, would push forward and keep pushing and pushing harder and believe that I didn't have time for things like that. Whereas actually, I think it gives you time back. Um, I have a much clearer mind. How did you, I just want to track back a little bit with you because you've achieved amazing things um, in your life in terms of the success uh, the number of qualifications you've got, your success as an athlete as well. How have you balanced that? I know that um, we're going to come on to in a moment that you've been sick recently in the wake of this coronavirus, and I'd like to share more information on that. But before we get to that, up until now, how have you coped with all of those competing demands and succeeded as an athlete alongside? Um, I guess I mean, it's difficult difficult to answer that I'm I've always been a high achiever um, since I was young and grew up doing sport um, it was kind of like my get out from you know some family relationship dynamics that were problematic um, you know childhood trauma stuff and I went into sport but then at the age of 13 I got um, well, I got the <laughs> I got the measles as it as my psychiatrist called it but um, as classic psychiatry would call it I got um, I became anorexic was hospitalized um, for a while um, the, the psychiatrist said look your family's got the measles you've got the spots because I, I didn't have all the classic symptoms I knew I was skinny but it was it was basically a period of time where I really withdrew from all the stuff that was going on around me um, but I learned a lot from that but during that time I, I had to give up sport um, re recovered from that studied went to medical school um kings um which was a, di a difficult time i had a lot of anxiety initially when i first went there took up some running um took up running there then i had a life uh, changing moment in my final year of med school i was away in canada with a, um, a couple of other medical students and one junior doctor and i was skiing and it was this is before helmets were really popular and we we're on a new piste. I was skiing and I went over a mogul and uh, long story short, ended up having a contra coup. So falling on my head, falling back, sat up on the slope, said to the medical student that was with me, um, I feel very sick. I dreamt, I dreamt this. And then I passed out, basically started fitting on the slope. He essentially did CPR, saved my life. Wow. Eventually I got airlifted to the hospital and was in a coma for, um, on a juice coma for three days with a, with a head injury. Now, um, the sequelae from that, um, where the conventional medical system had no answers for me other than to medicate me for the, for the symptoms, which were the depression, insomnia, I just felt a uh, um, memory. I couldn't focus. I couldn't concentrate. I, w I went from being in the top percentile of my year at med school to being like bottom percentile and no one would listen. They basically thought I was malingering because now my MRI scan and my brain was normal. And this was before J James Cap Cracknell's story and stuff came out about the, the long-term effects of traumatic brain injury. So that, long story short, that traumatic brain injury and the recovery from that, which was very long, and I had to kind of figure out myself. Sport helped I, because I, I did become very depressed and I you know, was drinking too much. I started binge eating. Um, and I really, I was just one day, I'm like, I've got to stop this. I've got to kick myself out of it. And I entered a triathlon um, and I managed to get myself to the start line and, um, and, and did quite well. And that basically became the new thing. And I tried to train for it. I did quite, uh, continued to do quite well. I was finishing my junior doctor years at that time, which was a battle. There were lots of things that, that, that kind of went up and down, but triathlon um, really helped to, to kind of focus me and, and give me some sense of achievement and, and almost like validation. I, I didn't really know how to best put that, but um, long story short, I ended up winning, winning the World Age Group Championships, which was essentially an, 
had amateur um, um, triathlon championships in Australia in 2009, was given the opportunity to join the GB team, be coached by a world-class coach. So um, I, got, I was awarded a sabbatical from the London Deanery and I went to Thailand and trained with a world-class coach for um, best part of a year and yeah, and, and spent that time literally um, out of the NHS system and just and being an athlete. But I also, that's one, at the time when I set up this, this company, which was essentially offering private blood tests to um, initially to athletes, because my own experience was, well, why if I'm doing the same training as her, am I getting different results? And so I started to think about biomarkers that we knew influence performance like iron, B12, magnesium, you know, sex hormones, um, you know, like the effects of the contraceptive pill on, on energy, on your microbiome, on your B vitamin metabolism, all of that became of interest to me. So that, that company kind of became a consultancy and um, I, I, I saw like a niche, people were very interested in it. Then after my um, triathlon, professional triathlon years in which I was basically supported and sponsored and also made a little bit of money from this company, I joined another chap who changed the course of my life, um, was a guy called Dr. Jack Kreinler, who runs the Center for Health and Human Performance in Harley Street. And he kind of took me under his wing and mentored me. And I kind of felt like I had um, another, another voice, as it were, because, you know, in the medical profession, you, you're very much told to toe the line. And if you step out of the line, you, you, you're reprimanded. And I was always a kind of, you know, walking off peace person going, well, hello, that didn't make sense. Why don't we ask that question? That, that was kind of me. Um, but yeah, so I, I worked with Jack for quite a while. He's still a friend, a close friend now, um, even though I'm not at, at CHHP anymore. They're very, they're very sports and performance focused, but Jack is my kind of doctor and he's really helped me through this whole COVID thing, which we'll come to. So how do I cope with it all? I probably don't, is the answer. <laughs> I've, done, I've ended up doing a lot less exercise than I used to because what I noticed was because my my mind is so our minds are so powerful often i would drive myself to do the exercise at the expense of everything else and after a period of time that stops working and you start getting sick so i did a i did the london marathon after having my daughter i think she was six months because i'm like i've just got to do a flat marathon i've got to go sub three um i think i did 248 and um yeah, and, and then I started to get sick more and more, like just little coughs and colds, and I'm like, hmm, something's not happen, not not right here. So I basically stopped stopped running, um, took up yoga, started doing more saunering, doing more restorative exercise, and um, and things improved. And a good friend of mine, Dr. Tommy Wood, um, has always encouraged me to do some more strength work because I'm, you know, my default is endurance exercise. And we know that endurance exercise in and of itself is probably not good for us, especially mm -hmm. if done excessively, uh, especially as we age. So it's but a, you, it's a learning curve, make, right? And um, <clears throat> yeah, no, I was just going to say, learning curve actually, for yeah, yeah, it is, it is a learning curve. And I think that's the thing as well as people often default, don't they, to the form of exercise that they've enjoyed for so long and push themselves. Um, and so, I mean, some of the science reports that I've looked at suggest that actually going over an hour in terms of endurance activity can start to be counterproductive in terms of heart health um, and things like that. So are you now, in terms of your exercise routine, do you stick to sort of restrictive, not during this period where you've been sick, but more generally, or do you still um, compete at all? I don't, I don't compete at all. Um, I tried, I, I dipped my toe back in the triathlon world um uh a couple of years ago and just felt like I was going through the motions you know did a few half Ironmans and and runs and I kind of just felt you know what I've done this I'm never gonna be as good as I was I can still do it I could prioritize it I could still train for it but um I just um I did I, it's just not there within me any anymore because I see it's depleting effects um, and I see the consequence in people that try and do it all long term from a medical perspective. They're the people that come to me and said, well, I spent 10 years doing this, being a city banker and a, and a triathlete and a, 
you know, a dad and, and now I can't do it anymore or I'm getting sick all the time, I'm getting depressed or I've got no sex drive or, you know, all of those things, they pop up after a period of time. And, you know, as much as I love the endorphins that I would get after achieving something you don't think is possible or going out on long runs and stuff, I know that from a physiological perspective and even from an ancestral perspective, think of it like that, how we evolved, right? We had long periods of, you know, strain, but then we had long periods of hibernation, recovery and downtime. Now we don't do that because we all want to be a hundred percent all the time. People assume that they, they're like, well, I could, I felt like that and therefore I can consistently feel like that. But I don't think as humans, we are meant to be that way. I think we go through periods of flux and I think we need to be more accepting of, of that, you know, this, this kind of this feast and fast concept is, um, is probably more attuned to that too. Yeah, I agree. And I think I find what I've found as well with women is I think that, um, you know, similar for me, when you have your first child and you realize how much that experience depletes your body, um, I think it's like the first wake up call. So women maybe are a bit ahead of men as we often are in terms of that, I suppose, maturity in a way that you start to realize that the constant pushing, pushing, pushing maybe isn't the best thing for you in terms of aging well. Um, whereas men, I find like with clients of mine, they're, they're still kind of pushing into their late 40s, early 50s, and then maybe realize that actually they can't continue. And, you know, the triathlons, the Ironman, et cetera, are, um, are possibly causing them too much. Um, I know that you're quite... I also think it's, in, it's yeah. probably important to mention on that stage too that, you know, women have fluctuations in... We're not small men. We have fluctuations in in hormones on a month to month basis. Um, you know, and we also have periods in our life, like, you know, uh, menarche when you first go through periods, when you, when you get pregnant and then postpartum and then menopause, when we get huge shifts in our hormones and these, you know, these hormones determine a big part of how we feel and function. And there's not enough voice given to that. Men have, you know, testosterone, which is fairly consistent over the course of their lifetime until, you know, they reach some people get this precipitate, you know, decline as they hit their late, you know, hit their late forties, fifties, but it's, it's not universal. So men have a lot of more stability in their milieu, in their environment than, than women do. And we should encourage, you, you know, we should encourage that with women, but also note that we're a bit, well, we're complex. Yeah, we are. That's true. I mean, I think it's Stacey Sims who did quite a bit of research. Was she, um, she was a competitive athlete. Yeah, as well. fascinating. Yeah, the menstrual cycle and how dehydrated women could be depending on where they were in that in that month. Um, yeah, did you find that effective? So you, you should probably... Um, as an athlete. It's probably worth noting on that because I've been learning a lot. I work, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm worked as an advisor and I'm close to this um, wonderful girl called Helen Guillaume um, who runs a company called Wild.ai. And she basically does that. She allows, she's got a, an app that allows people to track their menstrual cycle, their mood, their food, and, and give you advice from the research to how you should um, alter that through the course of, um, of the month. So she's, she's fascinating. It's, it's one to watch. So I've learned a lot about, you know, the, how your physiology can affect um, mood, but also fuel part partitioning, as we call it. So whether you're using, where you're, whether you're using fat, or whether you're using carbohydrates as your predominant fuel source um, when you're exercising at different times of the month, depending on your hormone levels. So yeah, big fan of Stacey. I've followed her for a long time. Hmm. Another one is Alicia Vitu, isn't it? She's done quite in the flow. Goes in similar to what your friend does, I think. So what, what's this app? So I'll link to this in the show notes. Did you say it's wild.ai? So wild wild.ai i think yeah okay interesting is that, does yeah. that give wild. nutritional yeah. recommendations as well um in terms of yes it does exercise? okay brilliant um She's, yeah i think they have the former cto of flow working with them now so yeah okay flow the you know so there's a lot of interplay there between what it does interesting i will um link to that thank you for that I think many people will find that helpful. I know that your um, reason you might get her on. Hel Helen's very, um, she's wonderful. Probably get her on sometime. She's, she's okay. Yeah, awesome. brilliant. Very, very strong entrepreneurial woman. Yeah, I'd love to do that. Um, I think that would benefit lots and lots of people. Um, so I know you're slightly tight on time today, and I do want to talk to you about your experience with the coronavirus because I think this can help a lot of people. I've been following your posts um, quite closely on Instagram, and 
it sounds like you've had, or in fact, I know you've had a very tough time of it, despite being in such good health yourself. So do you want to talk us um, through that um, rather than me kind of recount what you put in the post? Um, because this has been going on for you for about three weeks now that you haven't felt complete. You're not completely back to normal yet either. No, no, it's been a, it's been a long haul and people keep saying, but you look okay. I'm like, well, there's, there's some periods when I, I really don't look okay. And um, it's, it's been an extraordinary journey. And I, yeah, I did recount it on social media when I finally got some, some energy back. But, you know, as a, as a long story short, I started off with, um, on the 14th of March, with a fever overnight, which was recorded by my aura ring. I haven't got it on now. It's charging. I know you've got one. Um, and it was literally plus 3.3 Fahrenheit. So the evening leading into that, I felt shivery. I had some abdominal pain in the side of my stomach. I, I went to bed and then my aura ring gave me a terrible score in the morning. I remember waking up in the night, reaching for a cup and it was like, oh, my hand just felt so weak. And I'm like, what's happening to me? I took Tamiflu, which was prescribed to me by a, a, a private doctor, which was thought to have some um, efficacy then. Um, I think it did help to some degree. Um, but it also made me a little bit more, um, it probably suppressed my immune response a bit. So I didn't get a fever the, the next night, but I started to develop a, like a tight chest and then just felt quite ag a little bit agitated, a little bit wobbly. Anyway, over the course of that week, I developed, my chest got a little bit more tight and I got a bit wheezy. And then I started to, um, I didn't really have a cough. I started to get, um, just a little bit more difficult to breathe. And then on day seven, I developed this eye-watering, eye-watering pain in my hips, in my hip flexors, in my lower back. And I thought, I felt like my body was on fire, that I was falling apart. Um, and we now know that that is correlated with um, the likelihood that you will develop severe disease, a, a more severe form of COVID. We did not know that then, but some of the research that's come out from... Um, from, from London University Hospitals is, is that that and a rise in one of your liver function uh, enzymes plus your low white cell count is correlated with worse disease. I had all of those. Um, I didn't like, would I have panicked more if I knew that? No, but I would probably have, have, have sought to go into hospital at that point in time. So this pain in my hips and my lower back, I rang NHS 111 in the middle of the night. I was alone, I was alone with my daughter and they were like, well, we can give you a prescription of a stronger painkiller. So I took some codeine phosphate and it made it a bit better. Then I, my chest just, just got worse, basically. I was, I was out of breath, walking up a flight of stairs, having a shower. Um, I started on an antibiotic called azithromycin, um, which helped. Um, and also I did a couple of days of that malarial drug that you probably have heard of, um, hydroxychloroquinone. Again, all private prescriptions, and I can't advocate for their, for their use. They need to be overseen by a medical professional. Um, I did not have a good reaction to hydroxychloroquinone. It, um, it made me feel, uh, give me tinnitus in my head. It made me feel very wobbly with my blood glucose. I literally thought I was going to pass out. I didn't know all these things at the time because I wasn't given that information. I had to kind of figure it out myself. Um, so that was all going on. And then I started to feel a bit better, sort of between seven and uh, between 12 and days, 12 and 14. Then I went out for a long walk. Um, I was on the phone. I also took a supplement called DMAE, which I do take occasionally for, to help brain and mood. And I think it lets you dig into your resources a bit too much. Um, so I did a bit too much, came home, felt a bit tired, went to bed. Next morning, I woke up with a, um, a really pounding headache and a sinus infection, um, which I've never had a sinus infection. And started. To, I spiked a fever again, was sweating. Up, um, and basically, I was back, back where I was um, with this sinus infection. And, and my chest was increasingly tight. I, I called a few doctor friends of mine. I started another couple of days on this hydroxyquinone because even though I've had a bad reaction, we do know that it stops, it can stop the effects on the lungs. So while it can have side effects, it can stop the virus like hitting your lungs. So um, my chest did get better, but then I developed um, 
um, this kind of widespread like muscle fatigue and weakness, which I still have a bit now. I mean, literally I can do very little. Um, I might not look the, I'm, I'm sick, but I'm compared to how I normally am. I'm still struggling like a little bit to take a full breath. I still, you know, getting a little bit, um, I still feel weak. I still feel shaky. Then I, as I said to you offline, um, I thought I was getting a bit better. And on Tuesday, I developed this, what they thought was anaphylactic reaction. Like my immune system is just kind of gone crazy. My, I, I started to feel quite weak again. I was just out in the, in the garden with my daughter. My throat, my um, neck swelled up, my chest swelled up, went red. Um, my face went red, swollen, like my whole arms went, and I was like, this doesn't feel right. I took an antihistamine, spoke to um, a couple of uh, colleagues of mine. They were like, you've just got to monitor your SATs level, your oxygen saturations. And I have a lot of lung reserve, you know, given my history as an athlete. So my SATs level didn't really drop. My oxygen saturations was measured by the finger probe. Um, I've got one here. So anyway, I ended up going to hospital because I felt genuinely terrified. Um, and even though I could breathe through my anxiety, I thought this is... This is like nothing I've ever experienced. I literally didn't feel like I could stand. Um, anyway, went to, to the to the A and E um, and in in Devon, where there's not much coronavirus at the moment compared to London. They checked on my lungs and my um, uh, my oxygen saturations. My blood pressure was very low. My heart rate was high, but my lungs were essentially apart from some crepitations in the left upper lobe were, were essentially clear um and actually i i don't I, I felt like they couldn't wait to get rid of me once they found that my lungs were clear they gave me another dose of antihistamine and told me to go home and rest um but you know i guess what the essence is now i'm like at day 24 now i want people to understand because i'm i'm also dealing with this as a doctor with other clients in various people that had it we do we can't predict the effects of this virus it has such widespread effects on different people you know i've had young people who are you know in their 30s who have developed you know severe chest pain um but it hasn't descended into a pneumonia um they think i did have pneumonia which is probably one of the reasons i've been affected so badly i also um the this persistent muscle weakness and this immune system dysfunction is can all be part of this this post viral or this, this, this whole viral syndrome that, that people do seem to get. Um, so listen, it's, it's been, it's been, like I say, pretty frightening because we, we don't know what can happen. And I still feel, as I said, you know, pretty, pretty wobbly with things, but what I want people to learn is that we've just got to, we've got to keep in contact with, you know, um, I guess doctors or people that you feel supported by because, you know, unless you're really sick, they then they're not they don't take you into hospital. You know, the, the wor most worrying factor for them is this whole concept is your blood oxygen saturation dropping. Um, so I advise anyone to, to, to buy up these cheap oxygen saturation monitors and put one on your finger and, and monitor it. And if it drops below 96, you, you call someone. Um, the widespread sort of like post viral syndrome that I've talked about, which, you know, I mean, it, it's extraordinary. Um, and we don't know how long it's, it lasts, but it can last, you know, weeks, months after you've actually finished having viral symptoms. You can still be, you can still be weak. You can still have, you know, raised slightly raised heart rate, uh, poor exercise tolerance, all of that. Um, I'm very interested in they they tried to put take a blood test on me at the hospital, but failed um, because my blood pressure was low with the allergy. Um, so I was thinking about, I really would like to see what my blood test markers are doing, are doing now, because then I feel more confident to be able to manage um, or be able to objectify what's happening because you can get in your head around this and you can start, um, you can start worrying. Like you get certain twinge and, you know, you, you start to feel that you're going to go downhill again. So my daughter's come in because she's, um, she's been a little bit worried about mummy and she just wants to know I'm all right. Um, but yeah, so I'm just, I just wanted to just tell people that, that, that no one is immune from getting this. Stay in close contact with your, with, um, with your doctor. Um, 
do everything that they say on this text message that's saying really stockpile food, um, uh, uh, you know, like batch cook food now, buy the oxygen saturation monitor, make sure you've got adequate stocks of paracetamol, avoid, uh, avoid ibuprofen, um, good doses of fish oil, lots of things in the diet like garlic and, and broths and all of those kind of things can really help. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a bumpy ride. I've seen that you take and I was just having a look at your, that uh, on your um, post, you were talking about some of the other things you took as well. Um, liposomal mm. curcumin and vitamin C, vitamin D, and then N-acetylcysteine and collagen peptides as well. Have you, is that something you've taken all the way through? The curcumin was what for the aches and pains primarily and sort of lowering the- Yeah, and I actually think, yeah. And that, you know, there's good evidence. I follow Rhonda Patrick, found my fitness, and she's, she puts out a lot of literature on, on various things, including liposomal turmeric, mariva, thoracumin. Actually, palms, I don't, think it's, I don't think it's done a lot for my aches and pains, I have to say. Um, uh, soluble aspirin has really helped. I think the nlc cysteine has helped my chest. Um, I do take that consistently at a lower dose because it uh, supports glutathione levels. I can't tolerate glutathione in and of itself because um, when I used to have intravenous injections of it, I used to do one once a month, it ended up giving me bladder problems. So I, I take nlc cysteine as a glutathione precursor normally, but there is evidence that it can potentially help. The cysteine can help the lungs. Oregano oil I have been taking because it's got natural antimicrobial action. Who knows if anything works against COVID, to be honest, we're throwing things against the wind. I did an intravenous vitamin C megadose, nine grams. If some, by American standards, that's not megadose. I feel like it made me worse, but it might've been coincidental. I've been taking liposomal vitamins. I, I, why I say it made me worse is because um, potentially is a high acidic load on the body. And if you're already inflamed, adding an acidic load to the body could potentially get worse than inflammation. So I, I yeah, I, I, I'm not I sure how I feel about, about that. that. I think everyone would be. Yeah, because I'd seen things in the press that, um, um, and the literature that was conflicting about whether you should really high dose with vitamin C. So that'd be the reason not to then is because of the acidity. Um, because in some places they've been using it what would be like what listen, are your thoughts on it would you say to people listen the hardest i really don't know and i've spoken to people who are who are far cleverer than i am in this and you know i just i just wouldn't do it i think there's too many variables to mess with if you're in hospital being in with you know being monitored having your electrolytes monitored having your inflammation levels monitored then you know, by all means experiment. But I think, you know, I've seen a lot of biohackers get stuff wrong and, you know, supplements in excess can, you know, cause things to go wrong. You know, I feel like personally, like I might, my anaphylactis might have been triggered by this cordyceps mushroom that I tried for the first time. I just don't know. And therefore I'm more, I, in an illness that's so unknown and causing effects in different people that are unpredictable, I think we have to be careful with megadosing anything. Um, that is my that is my opinion, um, and I know a lot of people are megadosing with things, but you know, one to three grams of vitamin C a day, fine. Magnesium, fine. Fish oil, good and anti, a good anti-inflammatory, and acetylcysteine, but you know, just, just be a little bit cautious about the potential interactions with these things on an immune system that is already in many people with this illness, especially when it descends, if it descends, is hypervigilant, right? You know, which means it's, you know, overreacting to any potential stimuli. Mm -hmm. I haven't had any allergic reactions, you know, in my life. And then I suddenly started to develop these weird things. Um, so... You know, what, I don't know why I've had such a bad reaction in, in someone that's potentially, you know, healthy. But as, as we discussed offline, you know, this did hit me at a period of time when I, you know, there'd been a fair amount of stress in my life, running, running a business, having a small child, um, single mom. Um, you know, all of those things do kind of add up on a personality that is, you know, hardwired to push, push, push until you drop. Mm. Um, yeah. and usually when I drop you kind of 
usually, and I was saying this to the doctor this morning, um, Dr. Jack was, I usually bounce back, right? If you give me a few days rest, I'll bounce back. It's three and a half weeks now. And there's been days where you're like, you get this, what seems to happen with this illness in people that develop the more severe forms is you get a window and you're like, oh, I feel better. I go for a walk. And you go for a walk and you're all smiley and happy. And then you come back and you wake up the next morning and you're like, oh my God. And that is very difficult to deal with from a mental health perspective because you kind of think, whatever I do, I'm screwed. Um, so you have to look at the small wins and, you know, the, the, the things that have really helped me, um, Dr. Joe Dispenza, I don't know if you follow him. I do. He's my he's a, yeah. I like Joe. Yeah, he, he's lovely. Um, you know, a little, some of these people, you know, a little bit cuckoo in some people's eyes, but, you know, I've met Joe personally and he sent me one of his personal meditations and it's really helped me because you know, we're all kind of reaching out for some kind of security somewhere. And, you know, I'm on, in contact with ITU consultants and really smart doctors and there's no security. And suddenly everything you thought, you know, has been pulled out under your, on your feet. And then you start to experience symptoms and you feel like your body isn't your own. And that mm -hmm. is bizarre. So all the time there's this interplay between, huh, what's that thing? I've not had that before. Or God, I feel weak. I can't stand. I can't even do freaking yoga. And you get this interplay between saying like, this is, this is something we don't understand. We don't understand it as medics. So that's, that's potentially destabilizing. Now, positive silver lining is that, you know, that people are working tirelessly on this. Doctors, researchers are working tirelessly to understand this virus. And I believe they'll get there because, you know, you put enough smart people together, they, they will work this out. But, um, you know, people are trialing a lot of things and throwing things up against the wind at the moment. And um, we, we just don't know enough yet. So sit tight. Because, you know, I was unlucky. I got it early, didn't know a lot, tried a lot of things, um, you know, suffered the consequences of some of these medicines like the quinone, um, which may or may not have helped me descend further with the, the chest symptoms. Um, so, you know, sit tight, just, you know, be safe. And yeah, I mean, that's why I could say avoid, avoid getting it if you can. You know, when, we, when it started off, I remember people saying to me, oh, we should just get it because... You know, then most of us, it will just be a cold or a mild flu and we'll get over it. You know, I'm, I'm testament to saying this is not a cold. It's not a flu. It's been horrendous and persistent. But, you know, hopefully coming through the other side now and I'm having the news that my chest is, is more or less clear is, is a good thing. But, you know, don't jump up and start going back to your normal life because, um, as I try to, because... It, the, the virus sits around a lot. It can reactivate the effects, your immune system, triggering off inflammation, triggering off blood glucose fluctuations. All of that takes time to recover from. And um, friends and people that, that love me keep reinforcing this on the day-to-day -day basis if they hear me outside walking, um, you know, taking calls because you think you can do more than you, you can. Um, and I think that will always be me. And this is this has been very uh, leveling this illness to make you think, take a, take a think about, you know, that you can, no, no one's invincible. Mm, you realize your vulnerability. And what about with your um, daughter? I mean, I saw her come in there. She, did she um, get symptoms of it? How did you manage that? Because obviously you can't isolate as a single mum from your daughter. Um, I know they've said that it seems to be less bad in the young. What did you find happened with her? <laughs> she had... I look at her and I'm amazed. She had one night of feeling of, of, of a temperature, but you know, no more than she would have had for, with any other bug at school. Yeah. She had a cough for three days, a little light cough, but was still jumping around. Yeah, but she's been isolated with me, but has had very like, no symptoms. My, uh, my um, au pair has been unwell as well, uh, as has her dad, who's been in isolation as well. So, but I... Um, yeah, so there's, there's we, we've all basically had it, but she was probably a transmitter, um, yeah. and was very, very, very low level affected. It's curious. Which that I'm, I'm grateful for. Yeah, of course. Um, it's curious that in a way that like they're saying, or they were saying in terms of like government mm -hmm. advice that you could, after you've had, or you believe you've had it then seven to 14 days later, you can go out because would it not suggest that if you're still three weeks later experiencing some symptoms, does that mean that you could still potentially pass that virus on? 
how have they kind of, or do you think the thinking is beginning to change in terms of how long you're actually infectious for? Absolutely, for sure. Um, yeah, as Dr. Jack said to me, you know, you could be viral shredding for weeks. We, we, we just don't know. Um, as I said, you know, I did have a, a viral PCR swab that I did with the doctor's laboratory private um, company, the biggest private company in London. They're supplying the tests to the NHS as well. So they are validated tests. So no, I mean, I wouldn't, my mum lives over the, over the hill and um, we're seeing her from like 20 meters difference. I'm not going anywhere near her or touching anything that, that goes near her. So I do, I do not think that, I think that is very um, unwise advice mm. saying that people stop and then um, I, I just don't think we know. And, and until we can be repeatedly testing people with um, valuable, uh, validated tests, then no one is safe. Yeah. You know, I think, listen, what, what we do know is that you know, the, the most likelihood of this, this virus shredding is through, you know, mouth, nose, cough, you know, actual droplets. Um, so, yeah, I mean, yeah. So if, if, if you're not doing that, then the likelihood is low. But, you know, I, I don't want to encourage a, um, a, you know, a sort of a lazy fair attitude at all. I think, I think, you know, if you are 14 days post and you're going out, then you should still wear a mask and you should wear gloves. Mm -hmm. um is my opinion or not what about the um the test so i've seen like, i think regenerous has one um the, the blood test quite a few people have been putting them on so sure where from my reading it seems just that actually it's not um clear that if you do that and it shows antibodies that actually that is against coronavirus um or at least this particular strain what are your thoughts on that because i know quite a few people have been posting about this blood test there's there's a variety of different blood tests and yeah I'm I mean I'm going through this in my own um, in my own business and my own um, personal like how which tests to do um, because some of them are you know known to be hugely unreliable is it a Dutch test you know should we do the one from from, from the Netherlands should we do one from Germany should we do the one from China I don't know and so I'm going with um, waiting for Dr Jack to come up with his you know um, I I can get the Dutch ones I can get the Chinese ones but you know. Am I going to be reassured by a negative result? Probably not. Or positive result. You know, I, I, I don't know anyone that's actually developed antibodies personally from this yet. So we'll see. And, and is that licensed to say, I'm immune, I can go out? We, just, we still don't know. We really don't know. And, um, you know, if my PCR swab said, you know, the SARS-2 coronavirus, is that the ones that I'm, I, I, I had the virus virus confirmed is is that the one i've got antibodies from i don't know the jury's out we need another few weeks to really um to really know i don't think we can be assured by the current tests on the market and so just to kind of sum up there to make sure i have it right what you were saying is don't don't go too crazy on any one kind of supplement but things like up to three grams of vitamin c spread across the day may be helpful and presumably may also be helpful in advance of having it um, making sure that you've got good vitamin D levels, particularly after the winter that we had. I imagine a lot of people are pretty deprived. And then um, omega-3 and acetylcysteine, um, but not, nothing in too crazy levels. And also avoiding ibuprofen, because I know that was a big kind of thing as well that was sort of going back and forth. Was it, would, would it make the virus worse? And what you're saying is take aspirin or paracetamol, um, but stay away from ibuprofen. Uh, and also aspirin, I think, you know, we just don't know yet. Uh, I'm late on, you know, in the in the course, and now I'm managing basically convalescence and immune side effects. This, the side effects of the immune system activation rather than the, the virus itself. Um, I haven't retested, so I don't know whether my virus will be bad. So I just want to say to people, no, if you can manage with, with paracetamol and then something stronger like I did, like cocodamol, um, you can still get eight, 500 cocodamol in, in pharmacies. The stronger one needs to be prescribed. Um, yeah, I mean, a, a vitamin C, you know, listen, it, it's, as I said, the liposomal form is better tolerated because the ascorbic acid, the kind of, you know, barocas and stuff that you buy are very, very acidic, quite harsh on the gut, can cause stomach upset, diarrhea. Um, if you can get hold of the liposomal form, which is is basically you know absorbed better into the mouth and to the into the mucous membranes rather than causing upsets. That that would be good. Omega three may help um, reduce some of the inflammatory side effects in the in the gut. I did mention this liquid turmeric, curcumin, 
um, metacumin, those uh, theracumin, I'm mentioning a, num a number of brands. Now, theoretically, that should help inflammation. As I said to you, I don't think it helped me, but who knows, because it could have been worse. Um, aspirin, yes, wait, wait until um, later on, um, you know, and, be, and have regular paracetamol, which can help dampen down any any muscle or side of, or, or inflammation. But listen, if you do develop very severe muscle aches and pains, you know, day seven, then you should you should contact um, you should contact NHS one one one, especially if you've got any comorbid conditions. Um, and you, you're correct on the on the other supplements. I think with the vitamin D, I think getting into the sunlight, mm -hmm. having some UV. We all know it's not good for our skin, but we do know that it has antiviral properties and it will boost your vitamin D levels probably better than um, and have more impact on your immune system rather than you mega dosing vitamin D because you can quickly put things out of balance. You know, I always advise vitamin D taking along vitamin K um, to stop calcium metabolism going out and out of balance. Hydrate, you know, I, I recommend electrolyte um, solution um, for people because you, you do get some kind of muscle cramping. You do also get secretions, you know, from your nose and your, your chest and all of that depletes electrolytes. Also the sweating, if you develop that, that will deplete your system. So don't net tons of water without replacing your electrolytes. Um, you maybe even some extra sea salt uh, on, on foods and bananas for your potassium. All of those things can help. Great. Thank you um, so much for all of that. So um, where can people find you on your site on Worldgevity? Um, can you just share exactly where they can find you? I know you're pretty active on Instagram as well. I go in and out with Instagram. I'm trying to get someone to help me because I have a love-hate relationship. I, I don't usually come off of social media feeling much better. <laughs> Having said that, preempting that by saying that I know you're going to speak to Richie Bostock and I do follow his, he's a friend of mine, I do follow his breathwork sessions on Instagram Live, but I feel a lot of hustle on Instagram sometimes and I feel like that detracts some, uh, my peace of mind uh, sometimes. But you can find me at Sporty Doc. I've been on that forever. I haven't managed to get the World Jeopardy Instagram sorted yet. So that's at sport, i.e. doc. Um, and then well, the World Jeopardy website is being redone as we speak. My original website with all my sporty doc sporting stuff is sporty doc, same as instagram.co.uk. Um, and then World Jeopardy, that's well, G E V I T Y.com. Brilliant. Yeah, and I please reach out with your experience. I like to, um, I like to try and help people. I'm spending a lot of time on the phone to, 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 to anxious people on a day to day basis and, and trying to guide people. So I'm happy to, to share a non inflammatory, non inflammatory experience. Brilliant. And they would do that through your website or is there an email? What's the best way of them kind of getting? Yeah. That? Info at wellgevity dot and co dot UK. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. I will link to all of that in the show notes. And just to say, I know you're not, you're still not feeling great. So it was, um, I'm very grateful to you coming on today and sharing all of that. Um, I think it'll help so many people. So thanks again for doing that. No worries. It's nice to see you. And you.